morning, church. Come, let's worship God wherever you are. Let's yeah. give Him your highest praise. Amen. Amen. Come on, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Can you sing it from the top? You can take my morning, turn it into dancing, Lord. Take your broken vessel, put it back together, Lord. But your goodness does He makes all things new You make all things All things new That's right You make all things Beautiful Jesus You rose again Defeat of death And now I live Shining like the break of day That's who you are, Lord Cutting through the silence I can hear the sound of change Can you hear it change? Things that I've been bearing You are resurrecting you again Every prayer you remember True to all your promises Come on, tell them today You make all things all things new He's the God of the new You make all things beautiful Jesus Jesus You rose again Defeat of death And now I live You make all things All things new Come on, jump, jump Wherever you are All things new Father, we just thank you so much. You are the God of the new. Father, we thank you that in you, we are a new creation, yes. Lord. Amen. We thank you that in every season, Lord, you remain faithful in our lives. Hallelujah. God, I pray that even today, you make things so much clearer for thank us, you, God. Amen. That we be able to see your plans, your vision Amen. for our Jesus. lives and what you're doing in our nation. Surrender to you. We look yes, to you Lord. today, Lord.
So I lift my voice. I have resolved to serve you more. Jesus be
we just thank you so much God we say that you are our one and only desire Amen. Amen. God I pray that even in this time that we'll grow to know you more and more that God even your word says even as we draw close to you you will draw close to us God Amen. so we thank you we thank you Holy Spirit that you yes. are working in us that you are doing a new thing in us, Lord. That's right. Help us see things from your perspective, yes. God. Amen. We thank you and we love you. you in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Thank you for tuning in and it's always so good to see all of us online. Right now, it's giving time and I just want to share a little something with all of us today. It, you know, these few days, I'm sure that many of us are aware that it has been just bad news over bad news that's happening around us. And you know, sometimes it feels like we're stuck in this situation. You know, it feels like there is no way out to this. But as I pray and seek God, God has reminded me constantly that He is a God that will always, always make a way. Amen. And let me read to you from Isaiah chapter 43, verse 16. It says, I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. And in chapter 43, verse 2, it says, When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burnt up. The flames will not consume you. You know, friends, in this verse, it doesn't say if you pass through the waters, but it says when you pass through the waters. This means that we will definitely have to go through deep waters in our lives. Yeah. But one thing that we can be thankful for is that the verse doesn't just end there. It says when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. And this makes all the difference because difficulties may come our way but God will always be with us. Sometimes situations may look like there is no way out, but let's be remember that God is a God that makes a dry path through the sea. He is a God that makes a way. And even in the wilderness, He will make a way. Amen. So friends, this morning, let's surrender our worries unto Him. Let's surrender our country into His hands. And let's continue to believe wholeheartedly that God has us in the palm of His hands. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we surrender our lives before You and as we surrender our finances into Your hands today, God, I pray that You will remind us that we don't have to worry about what's going to come tomorrow because You are constantly looking out for us. And God, I pray that for those of us who are finding it difficult to believe and to trust that You will come true in such a time as this, that God, You will grant them the peace and assurance to know that You will make a way and really that no matter what seasons that we go through, no matter how we are feeling, God, we can have the assurance to know that you will never leave nor abandon us behind. And so God, we thank you for being the God that you are and we thank you that you always hold us in the very palm of your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, today we have a very, very special person here with us, and that is none other than Pastor David Goh. 
He is the senior pastor and also the founder of Banner of Love and he has been in the pastoral ministry for 31 years and that is just amazing. And you know, Pastor, it's such an honour and a blessing to have you share the word with us today. So Harvest Generation, let's show our welcome and support in the chat box below and let's get our hearts ready to receive. Yeah? Let's go! Now, very good morning to all of you brothers and sisters in Christ from Harvest Generation. I would like to take this opportunity to thank your pastor, Ryan Fu, and his beloved wife, Brenda, for giving me this time to fellowship with all of you and also to share the Word of God with all of you. Let us pray. You know. Father, I pray that I will be your mouthpiece. And what I share is not about me, it's about you. And I pray that, Lord, your word will go forth and serve, your, serve its purposes in all of our hearts, Lord. That you bring forth a challenge in us, a transformation in us, so that we can be prepared, Lord, to live a life of victory, Lord. A life where we are going to shine forth as salt and light to the world in this unprecedented time that we are living in, in Jesus' name. Amen, Lord. Now, how can you and I live victoriously, you know, especially in light of what is going on around us. We know that everything is falling apart, you know, and we know that we are actually living in the end times. You know, right? And in these end times, Jesus is about to bring His redemption plan for mankind to a closure. You know, because the Word of God tells us that God will not contend with mankind forever. You know. So in these last days that we realize that God is shaking everything that can be shaken. And as believers, it's vital that we must seek after the things that cannot be shaken. We must seek Him. We must seek His kingdom. We must seek His righteousness in order to live an overcoming life, a life of victory. So, and in this victory, we know that the presence of God is with us. So this morning, allow me to challenge your heart. And it's not about our serving. Of course, serving is important. The various ministries that God has entrusted to you is important. But this morning, we are not going to talk about ministries, but we are going to talk about your heart and my heart. Now, we, I realize that as we go on, in our journey with the Lord, more and more, our serving, our giving, though it pleases the heart of God, but it far more important is our living for God that matters to Him. In fact, it is our living, it's not our serving that's going to ensure that we overcome all the challenges before us and we will not go under. No? So in these last days where the call of God is for you and I to return to Him wholeheartedly. You know. It's about spiritual preparation. You look at the churches, we are all shut down and we are not able to even gather at our premises. You know. So it's no more about ministries, but preparation of our hearts. You know. The issue of our hearts that the Lord is after. You know. So my burden is to prepare you for uh, four things. You know. Four matters that is important that we need to consider. No? Firstly, we need to prepare ourselves for the greater trials, the greater testings and, and challenges and persecution that we are going to face. You know? The storm is here. No? The storm is going to come violently. You know? And we need to prepare our hearts for it. The day of trouble is here. No? The secrets, the mystery of lawlessness that leads to rebellion is here. No? Right. And when all this comes, right, increasingly our faith will be tested. No? And when you and I are tested, will we overcome or will we go under? No? When we are tested, no? can we still say the Lord is good no? all the time and all the time God is good? No? When calamities overtake us. You know. When the economic crash brings our money to become worthless, what do we do? You know? Or when we are under persecution because we bear the name of Jesus Christ, or if our possessions are confiscated. You know. uh, 
And when we look all around us where there's no roots of recovery, what do we do? No? Can we still say, we, we, love, we love you, Lord? No? And you see all around you, the scripture tells us you know, that it is just the beginning of birth pang. It's the beginning of sorrow and not even the end of sorrow. In other words, uh, greater challenges are going to come our way that the churches in this nation will have to face. And even our nation will have to face. You know. And in all this, Jesus say in Matthew 24, 13, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. You know. So Jesus in his foreknowledge knows that many are going to fall away. You know. Many are not going to make it when the severest of trials come their way. You, know. you look around us, so many people are suffering from fear, from anxiety, from panic attack, from depression. No? Some have suicidal tendencies and some have even committed suicide. You know? right. And Jesus said here, only those that endure to the end will be saved. You know? right. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, it says here, And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world, as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. You know? So it tells us that those that are able to endure to the end, not only will they be saved, but they will be empowered to bring the gospel of God's kingdom to the ends of the earth, and then Christ will come back. You know? In other words, out of all these crises that's going on, you know, it's going to lead to a worldwide revival where the overcomers, you know, those that endure to the end, will be able to go out with the power, with the anointing of God to bring in the last harvest. You know. yeah. So when everything falls apart, where there's no root of recovery, right, the overcomers are the ones that will have access to God, you know, access to the treasury of God, access to the hidden manna of God, no? access to the economy of God, access to the rule of God and the government of God. No? Right? So in this trying time, God is preparing us to live supernaturally for Him. You know? right. It's exciting, brothers and sisters. So prepare your hearts. You know? Prepare your heart for the challenges that is coming. You know? right. Because whether you like it or not, I like it or not, our faith will be tested. You know? So the next thing, we need to prepare ourselves because out of this, right, God wants to prepare us for revival. No? Darkness and thick darkness, as the scriptures say in, in Isaiah in the last days, darkness and thick darkness will cover the whole earth. You know? But the overcomers will arise and shine you know? because the glory of the Lord is upon them. So in other words, we are called in this last days, in this trying time that we are living in right now, to rise up and shine for God. You know? Shine in the midst of the darkness. You know? We can't pray away all the darkness because the Bible tells us that all these things must take place. Jesus said, I forewarn you. you know? right. Do not be surprised when you see all these things happening because I already forewarn you. you know? So we can't pray away all the darkness. We are supposed to shine as light in the midst of the darkness. You know? right. And Isaiah, it tells us that even kings will be drawn to us. You know? right. We will bring in the last harvest. Not because of our evangelistic programs, you know? right. but our very life. You know? right. That is going to make that difference. You know? right. It's not our nation building programs. You know? but it's still us, the remnants, the overcomers that's going to make a difference. You know? right. And now all this revival, millions and millions are going to come into the kingdom of God now, to bring in the last harvest. So brothers and sisters, let's look forward you know, to the great revival that's coming, the great awakening in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of the lawlessness, in the midst of the immense suffering that many are going through. Right? The church is supposed to arise and shine. You and I are supposed to 
arise and shine. No? Of course, the third thing we need to prepare ourselves for is the Christ's second coming back. No? Right? Christ is coming back soon. No? Right? And His second coming is a frightening day. It's a terrible day. No? In Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, it says that all mankind will mourn because of Him. John, who saw the resurrected Christ, appeared to him. You know, right? John, why he was on earth with Jesus, he's so close to Jesus Christ, uh, to Jesus, you know, right? He always lie at the bosom, the chest of Jesus, you know, so intimate you know, right? with the person of Jesus. You know. But when he saw the resurrected Christ, he fell at his feet as though dead. You know, right? Because Jesus is coming back no more as a baby Jesus, unnoticed, you know, unwelcome. You know, right? But He's coming to judge His church. He's coming to judge the nations of the world. You know? And we need to prepare ourselves for Christ coming back. You know? He's coming back for a bride that is without spot, blemish, or wrinkles. You know? And the fourth thing we need to prepare ourselves is for the judgment seat of God. Because one day, all of us must give an account of our life to Jesus Christ. You know? In other words, what you and I do on earth matters on the day of judgment. You know? right. And once the verdict is passed, either we'll be ushered into God's eternal dwellings or we may be cast into hell. You know? right. So the scary reality of heaven and hell it's real. You know? right. Hell is not a concept. You know? Heaven is not a concept. It is a reality. You know? right. And we know that when we are ushered into the dwellings of, of God, you know, His dwelling place, forever and ever we are with Him. You know? And if we are careless, we might enter into a eternal suffering you know, where there will be sorrow, there will be Regress and we are separated from God forever and ever. And I always felt that it's time for the church to bring back the doctrines of hell. You know? right. Because we realize that hell, as I said, is not, it is a reality you know? and it's not a concept. You know? So, brothers and sisters, the prophetic call of God to the church in these last days, right? Is this, you know, do we choose God or we choose self? You know? Do we choose God or we choose self? If we choose God, we will overcome. You know? If we choose self, we are going to go under. You know? So the call for the church to return to Him wholeheartedly. In this pandemic, in this lockdown, in this uh, enhanced uh, MCO, you know? right. let us take this time, you know, where we have more time to ourselves to return to God and seek Him wholeheartedly right? and wait upon Him and poise ourselves and get ready for the coming revival. Because God is about to do something that is going to astonish you and I, you know, in the midst of what is going on right now. You know? He's going to empower us with His spiritual authority, with the accuracy of His Word. He's going to point us, position us for revival. You know? So therefore, it is important that we come back to Him. We need to reprioritize our lives. You know? right. We must deal with what is in our heart. We must deal with the sin in our heart, you know? the issue of our hearts. You know? Whether there's covetousness or lust or pride or worldliness or any compromised positions right. that is against the Word of God. You know? And these are issues of the heart that must be overcome. You know? that you and I must have victory over. Because all this will ensure the presence of God with us. You know? We need the presence of God in us. You know? We need the power, the authority of God in us. You know? God talks about giving His church power and authority you know? right. on the basis all right, of our righteous living. You know? Therefore, it's important we deal with what is in our hearts. You know? Now, the principalities, the spiritual forces of Satan that holds mankind, will not bow down to you and I because of our good works alone. The devil will only bow down 
when he see the glory of God in us. Due to our righteous living before God. We can only conquer the powers of darkness of Satan that holds this nation and nations of the world by our righteous living, you know, by the glory of Christ in us. You know. It's not about nation-building programs. You know. It's not about occupying the seven mountains in the marketplace. You know. It's not even our evangelistic trust or not even our community works. Now, all these are, necess- are, are what God asks us to do. You know. And it's commendable. And when you're doing all these things, let, let me say this, right? It is commendable before God. But far more important is your righteous living and my righteous living. Right? Because many of us are serving God, no? but we have compromised. No? We have allowed the world to have the best of us. No? Right? Many Christians today, no? we have trivialized God, no? We have devalued God. We have disfigured God. We have defaced God. We have reduced God. We have depreciated God. And we, the church, are capable of trivializing God. God, our everlasting God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, many times are no more God himself. God is no more who he is to us. So we, the church, we have fashioned Him. Many times we have fashioned God according to our opinions, our ideas, or sometimes even our whims and fancies. That God is no more of any significant value to us. Yes, He's our Savior, but He is He, the Lord of our lives. And many Christians, we have devalued the Word of God. We know His Word is eternal. But yet, when the Word of God, when we read the Word of God, or when we meditate the Word of God, or when we study the Word of God, right, the Word confronts, many times confronts our way of living. You know? And often we react, or, or we compromise, or we explain it away. You know? right. And we de- de- disfigure or deface Him. You know? We misrepresent Him. You know? We only embrace His blessings, His prosperity, His favours. You know. We make claims from Him. You know. right. Yes, Lord, I'm a child of God. You must bless me. You must this and that. You know. right. But often we refuse His claims upon our lives to be holy, you know, to be set apart for Him. You know. So what do we do? We, so we rather give, we rather serve Him than to give our allegiance to Him. You know? Brothers and sisters, it's easier to serve God than to live for Him, than to give our life to Him. You know? right. And many Christians who have depreciate God, you know? we dare to bring our everlasting God to our level. You know? God is made to accommodate in our culture in our programs, in our ambitions, in our lifestyle, in our businesses, in our ministries, and even in our family. You know, that God is not able to be Himself anymore. You know? right. So now you know why right. the demonic kingdom is not threatened by the churches today. You know? right. Where is the authority? Where is the power? Where is the strength that Jesus, that the church is supposed to possess? You know? Why are still so many Christians struggling with sin and worldliness? You know? And brothers and sisters, in our waiting upon the Lord, in our seeking to Him, in returning to Him, what God shows, what is in our heart, let us repent you know? and make right and return to Him wholeheartedly. You know? We can't overcome all the troubles when it is at our doorstep. You know? right. We may even fall away and lose our salvation. Now, Jesus has overcome the world. In His darkest hour, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we know the story, He overcame and He went to the cross. Mankind, we are facing the same darkness today. Our dark hours are here. My question is, will we overcome? Or will we go under? Will we still dare to trivialize God? 
So I challenge you, brothers and sisters, young and old alike, let us come back to God wholeheartedly. And let's not take God for granted. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, it says these things happened to them as examples and were written now as warning for us on whom the culmination of the ages have come. Right? Let us learn from Israel history. You know? Paul is telling us right, in the New Testament, learn from, from Israel history. You know? Now we know that the Israelites are God's chosen people. God chose them, made covenant with them, revealed Himself to them. You know? God showed His awesome powers and, and miracles. You know? God blessed them. God protected them. But yet, they trivialize God no? that leads them to their backsliding. And Paul is saying to us today, you know, these things happen to them as examples and were written now as warning to us. You know. He's telling us, he's telling you and I, go back you know, and learn from them, you know. learn from the Israelites. You know. When they face temptations, they fell. You know? We can also do the same thing. You know? Now, if we continue to trivialize God, it will lead us to our backsliding. You know? right? The Israelites who knew the power of God has trivialized God. You know? And they end up, you know, the story tells us, they end up dying in the desert. You know? right? They were promised God promise to help them to enter into the promised land. But because they trivialized God, they could not enter into the promised land. What a tragedy. You know? They were delivered, they were blessed by God, only to die in the desert. So the Israelites trivialized God. You know? The Jews trivialized Jesus in the New Testament. You know? They heard the word of God, they heard the Sermon of the Mount. They saw the power, what Jesus has done. No? Right? The ministry of Jesus on earth right, was filled with all no? the power, the authority, the signs, the wonders, the miracle, and, and the teaching of, of the kingdom of God. No? They saw all this. No? But because they trivialized God, they end up crucifying Jesus. No? Now, even the 12 disciples we know that Judas at the end, right, after spending three and a half years with Jesus, he betrayed Jesus with a kiss of affection. No? Right. All for 30 pieces of silver. And at the time of the severest of trials, no? all the other disciples, they deserted Jesus. You know? Even Peter right, denied Jesus Christ three times. You know? So how is it possible no, that these Jews, they are recipients of the truth, that God is the one and true God, no, and yet they backslide. No. Now if God knows that they are going to backslide, why choose them? No? Why make covenant with them? No? And God is revealing to us no, that by themselves, they can't make it. No. And God is telling you and I today, by ourselves, we too cannot make it. You know? That's why there's an urgency in this last days, this prophetic call, return to God wholeheartedly. You know? Now these Jews, they are not stupid. They are not fools. You know? They've seen the power of God. They've seen the ten plagues. They, they've seen the parting of the Red Sea, the miracles. You know? right. They've tasted of the goodness of God. You know? But yet they backslide and fall away. You know? Now, the history of apostasy originated from God's chosen people. You know? And Paul is saying these things happen to them as examples. You know? And it's also written down as warning to you and I in these last days. You know? That right to the end of the age, Paul is telling us right to the end of the age, most Christians will still backslide and fall away. You know? Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. First 12. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Right? 
So, let us not be deceived. No? Let, us, let us not deceive ourselves that we think that we will never fall. No? We are nice people. We give, we serve. No? And God knows our hearts. No? God knows that we love Him. God knows that we worship Him. No? Whenever I challenge some, some brothers and sisters in regards to the blatant sin that they are, they are committing, you know, some of them are even leaders, you know, right? And they would tell me, Pastor, right? God knows my heart, you know. God knows my heart. God knows that I give my, a lot of my money, you know, to the ministry of God, you know. God knows that I've done this for Him. God knows I've done that for Him, you know. God knows my heart, you know, right? God knows that I love Him. God knows that I worship Him, you know. And I will tell them, do not be deceived. You know? right? And because God knows your heart, you must allow, you must ask God to come and change your heart. You know? So the Israelites saw the glory of God, and yet they backslided. You know? We think that if we see the glory of God, we will worship Him with all our hearts. You know? We will give our allegiance to Him. You know? We may be deceiving ourselves. You know? We must in returning to Him, allow God to come into our life and rule in us and deal with what is in our hearts. You know? Especially the evil things that, the secret things of our heart you know, that nobody knows, that your pastor don't know, right? your leaders don't know, only you know, God knows, the devil knows. You know? So for God to bless you and I is easy. You know? But for Him, to come and rule in our life is tough, you know. And the cry of God today is, will you and I allow Him to rule in us, you know? To rule in us. Right? Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 2, Paul goes on to say, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now here, God delivered the Jews from the Egyptians. You know. God was in the cloud, in the, in the pillar of cloud. You know. Moves and directed their journey in the day, provided shades from the hot sun. You know. God was in the pillar of fire, providing light and warm from the cold in the night, you know. Right. In other words, God's, Paul is saying God's presence is with them day and night, day and night, you know. Right. And Pharaoh, with his army, after Pharaoh realized that he has made a serious mistake, uh, mistake in releasing the, the Jews to leave Egypt, right. Pharaoh with his army pursued them, you know. And they came to the Dead Sea. Uh, sorry, they came to a dead end. Imagine the, the whole one, two million of these Jews or more, right? They were happily coming out from Egypt, you know, right? And as they were moving forward, this, in front of them was a Red Sea, you know? And the, at the back of them was the army, you know, right? On the left and right are mountains, you know? They are in a dead end, you know. They are trapped, you know. There's no place they can run, you know, run to, you know. And in these last days, we are going to face dead ends in our life, you know. All right. But is that, that is our, what we, have, we will face, you know. But God is God, you know. We know the story that God, Moses raises his staff, you know. The sea was parted, you know. The angel of God traveling in front of them withdrew and went behind them. You know? The pillar of cloud leading them moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the army and the Israelites. You know? Even in the dead end, God was with his people. You know? right. So they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and they saw the Red Sea roll back on the army and they were drowned. You know? What an awesome sight, you know. What an awesome God that they worship. No? And imagine these Israelites, these Jews, they saw this, the awesomeness of God's deliverance for them. You know? 
the impossible situation. And brothers and sisters, God will provide a way where there's no way. You know? When we return to Him wholeheartedly. You know? Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 4, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual milk, drink. And they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. You know? And in the desert, God provided supernaturally for them. Water, food, manna for 40 years. You know, their clothes and their shoes don't wear out. You know. So in other words, uh, even in the desert, you know, when nothing grows there, God did the impossible for His children. God showed Himself strong that He's able to provide even when there's drought. You know. So God is God. You know? Now in 1 Corinthians ch chapter 10, verse 5, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. You know? right? Since nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. You know? In other words, majority of them. You know? right? And when God is not happy with them, not pleased with them, what happened? You know? God's judgment came upon them. You know? And many of them died. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness, the desert. You know? right. they all, many of them died you know, in the desert. You know? right. And they, were, they, they died like carcasses. You know? Carcasses, the word carcasses is, is referred to animals who, who died. You know? And their flesh are all gone and all you see is the, the skeleton of the animal. You know? And God is referring them like animals, you know. Allowing His children to die in the wilderness, you know. That when they die, they don't even have, they are not even properly buried, you know. They are left to rot like carcasses, like animals rotted, you know. And their skeletons remain all over the desert, you know. One, two million of them over the years, you know. What a vast contrast, you know. On one hand, they were chosen, they were blessed, they were provided for, you know. On the other hand, they died like dead animals in the desert, you know? What a tragic death, you know. What a tragic ending, you know. Right. And many times the church have lost the fear of God. You know? right. We don't realize the awful and it is an awful and frightening thing to fall into the hand of an angry God. You know? And my cry for his church is embrace the fear of God in our life, you know. In you seeking God in this lockdown, you know, right. embrace the fear of God in your life. Don't lose it. You know. The church has lost it. You know. That's why the church is, we have taken ourselves into so many directions, so many ways apart from the ways of God. You know. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. Now, these things occurred as, as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. You know. So, it tells us, Paul tells us, serve as examples, as types, you know, so that we ourselves will not set our hearts on evil things as they did, you know. What are the evil things that they did? You know? The Israelites, like us, know our God as our true God, you know. Right. Blessed, provided for, delivered, you know. They, and like us, many times we never allow God to change our hearts, you know. And because we never allow God to totally transform our, our, our hearts, we never yield our life 100% to God, right. we will still be bent on doing evil things. You know? And eventually, it will bring judgment upon ourselves. You know? We must let God change our hearts. You know? right. Now, if you don't let God change your heart, you know? right. your heart and my heart, we will still be bent on evil. You know? Today we may be serving, you know, we may be giving, we may be blessed with wealth, with possession, with divine health, with successful ministries. You know. But yet it is not an indication that our hearts are pure, uh, we are spiritually alright. You know. I may be a, a preacher of holiness and righteousness, and righteousness, but yet I myself could be living unrighteous lifestyles. You know. Now, what are the evil things that they have committed that bring God's judgment upon them, though they are God's chosen people? You know? Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7, 
Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. You know? right? The Israelites know their God, you know? and yet they committed idolatry. You know? They worship idol. You know? Imagine after all the Red Sea experience, right? the, the dramatic incident before they are alive, you know. Yet they make an idol cast in the shape of a calf. You, know. you can read it in Exodus. You know. right. They make an idol cast in the shape of a calf. calf you know. And they bow down and they sacrifice burnt offering. They eat, they drink, they indulge in revelry, they indulge in run- drunkenness, they indulge in sensual- sensuality. You know. right. Before this golden calf, you know. Now, why did they make an idol? Because in their heart, they wished to see the invincible God. They desired to see God, which is a noble matter. But we know Moses was away for too long, 40 days. Right? And in their impatience, they make the calf out of the best ornaments. They give their best. You know? right? And in their worship, they call the calf, they are God, you know? Yahweh. You know? right? The same word as Yahweh, you know? What are they saying? They are saying that it is this calf that saved them from the ten plagues. You know? It's this calf that parted the Red Sea. Right. And when they did that, God struck them with a plague. You know? In Exodus 32-35. You know? God struck them with a plague. You know? right. So, is, are there idols in our lives? You know? right. And I think that many of us, we have Invincible idols in our life. You know. Anything that takes away your affection from God becomes an idol. You know. right. One author says that the hearts of men is like an idol factory, you know. making idols that look like God. You know. We are not even talking about hidden idolatry, but Christian idolatry. You know. That's why in 2 Kings chapter 10, uh, sorry, chapter 17, verse 40 to 41, it says, They will not listen, however but persisted in their former practices. Even while these people were worshipping the Lord, they were serving their idols. To this day, their children and grandchildren continue to do as their ancestors did. Many are worshipping God. Many are serving. Many are giving. But yet, at the same time, we could be serving the idols in our lives. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, these are the thing, evil things that they did before God. And there are more things that Paul say. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. You know. They committed sexual immorality. You know. Now, the background to this is King Bala of Moab. He bribed the prophet Balaam to curse the Israelites because he was fearful of these Israelites. He, he knew that these Israelites are very powerful. He also understood the power of blessing and curses. You know. All right. And this king, what a fantastic idea to get a prophet of God no, to curse God's chosen people. No. So Balaam knew the ways of God. At first, he refused. You know. He knew it is wrong. No. But Bala increases the offer. Though Bala is a prophet, but because of his, again, right? Though he's a prophet, but because of the, his, the greed in his heart, the covetousness is in his heart, right? He was on the way on a donkey to curse the Israelites, you know? See, he has never let God deal with his heart, though he's God's prophet. You know? And we know that while he was on the way, the donkey saw the angel of the Lord with a drawn sword. No? Right. Imagine, no? the donkey could see the angel of God. No? Where else Balaam could not even see the angel. No? You see how greed in his heart, no? the evil in his heart, no? blinds him that he can't even see when the animal can see. You know? right. He was blinded by his greed. No? And the donkey refused to move further when he saw the angel with the sword. And Balaam was angry and he beat the donkey with his staff 
three times, you know. Right. And the donkey spoke against the master. You know. Imagine the donkey opened his mouth and speak in human words, you know, and spoke against the master. You know. And it's also interesting, Balaam spoke back to the donkey. You know. Imagine, you know, again, if an animal were to speak to you in human words, you and I will probably run for our lives, you know. But Balaam still argue with that donkey, you know. Right? His greed has so consumed him, you know. He wanted Balak's uh, bribe, you know, offer. You know? So consumed him that right, right. he can't even, re- he doesn't even realize that an animal is talking to him, you know. And he can argue back with him. You know? And the angel opened uh, Balaam's eyes. Finally, he saw the angel with the drawn sword. He said, you know, I've sinned. You know? And he went, we know the story, he went and he blessed the Israelites four times instead. You know? And we think that it's over. You know? But in Revelation 2.14, it tells us though that though Balaam blesses the Israelite, his heart still remains unchanged. You, know? you see, again, the issue of the heart. You know? right. Though he said to the angel, I have sinned, but yet he was unrepentant. You know? right. He was convicted, but he refused to change. You know? He still went. He still won the money from Bala. You know? So brothers and sisters, don't underestimate the love of money in our life. You know? So what did Balaam do? You know? He already blesses the, the Israelites. But he went to the king Bala and teach him how to entice the Israelites to sin by committing sexual immorality. You know? Telling him, get your Moabite women uh, to have sex with the Israelite men. You know? And once they have sex together, they are bound together, right? they will worship your God Baal. You know? right? And it works. You know? And these men, they committed immorality. Sexual immorality with the Moabite women. You know? They committed idol- uh, adultery, you know, fornication. You know? Right. And at the end, they are so bound to these women that these women make them worship ba- Baal. You know? And God, in His anger, sent a plague and 23,000 of these men were struck dead in one day. You know? So Balaam, a true prophet who knows God, who knows his ways, but never allowed God to change his heart, became a false prophet. So brothers and sisters, times like this, we have to check, challenge us, ask God to show us what is in our heart. Is there fornication, adultery, prostitution, pornography, homosexuality? And so many Christians are trapped in these areas, you know. So many Christian men are, are womanizing, womanizing, you know, right? And they are getting away with it, you know, because they have already trivialized God, you know? right? And we think only Christian men are womanizing. Christian women are also manizing, you know, right? Young men and women, may I challenge you, you know, stay away from fornication, you know? cut off any wrong relationship in your life, you know. Don't play with the fire of God's judgment. No? Many are serving, but yet they are saving. You know? right. Where is the victory? You know? Over the temptation in their lives. You know? And these are evil in the eyes of God. No? And Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 9. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. You know? They tested the Israelites, they tested the Lord, you know. They spoke against Moses and God Himself, you know. All right. They murmur, they grumble, and uh, right. every time they face a pressure, a, a trial or a testing, you know, they will murmur against Moses, they will grumble against Moses and against God, you know. And God, in His anger, judged them, you know. All right. And God called out poisonous snakes amongst them, and these snakes came and bite a lot of these men and women, and they died, you know. My question to you and I is, do you and I dare to test the Lord? 
Do you and I dare to test his patience? You know? Do you and I dare to continue to take him for granted? You know? God's patience, God's grace is to lead us to repentance. You know? Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. And do not grumble as some of them did, and they were killed by the destroying angels. You know? They murmur, they grumble. You know? And in Philippians 2, 14, we are told that to do everything without murmuring, grumbling, arguing, gossiping, slandering. And God hates, hates it all. No? Right. But they continue with it. No? And God in His anger, He sent His own destroying angel to kill them. You know? And in one day, 14,700 of them were struck dead All right. by the destroying angels. You know? God's destroying angels, not the demonic angels. You know? And in verse 11 and 12, as we have read earlier, Paul is telling us, you know, all right, we are warned not to take God for granted. It's time that the church stop trivializing God. You know, all right. We must deal with the issue of our hearts, own hearts, you know, so that we can live a victorious life. You know. right. Let us approach God in the fear of God. You know. Our God, an awesome God, holy and true, you know, or which without holiness we can't see Him. Let God's consuming fire come, consume our sin, our dross, our addiction, our worldliness in us. You know? right. So that the same fire that consumes the dross in our life, the same fire become a wall of fire around us. You know? And we will be poised. You know? right. we, have, we will overcome whatever trials that comes our way. Whatever storms that comes our way, we will be rooted 100% in Christ Jesus, you know. And, and we will build our life upon that rock, you know, that is unshakable in Jesus' name, you know. And not only that, we will be poised to do great exploit, you know. Right? A time will come, we will be like in the early church, you know. Right? You remember the same Peter that denied Jesus three times, but after that, that encounter, the repentance, the encounter with the Holy Spirit in the upper room. He came out with the upper room. You know, right? And all this, Peter and all the 120 that came out from the upper room, they never come out with a strategy. They will never come out with a vision. They never come out with a, a plan, a 10 years plan, a 5 years plan. You know? But they came out with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know? And the same Peter right, that denied Jesus, the same Peter when he preached that message, you know, one message, 3,000 of them come to God. You know. right. Today, we preach so many messages you know, and only one or two persons come to Christ. You know. Something is amiss in the church of Jesus Christ. You know. And God, in these last days, as He shut down all the churches, you know, right, is to force us to return to Him wholeheartedly. You know. Force us to relook Restart our, our walk with Him one more time, you know. And let the authentic, authenticity, authenticity of the Holy Spirit coming back to us one more time, you know. Right. And the same Peter, where, when he met, he met the lame man on the road, you know, begging for money, you know. What did he say to the lame man, you know? Right. He said, silver and gold I don't have, you know. Money I don't have, you know. Right. But what I have, I give to you, you know. What I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And we know that laymen walk again. You know? right. We are living in such exciting times, you know. Right. That God wants to prepare us spiritually, you know. Right. Look at Daniel, you know. Right. He was a slave, you know. Right. But he made Nebuchadnezzar, he, we know the story he interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream, you know, right? He made the most powerful king on the face of the earth during that time, you know, to lie prostrate before him, you know, right? Not kneel down, but prostrate before him, you know, right? A slave, you know, the most powerful king on earth, you know, on the face of the earth, bowing down to a slave, you know, sorry, prostrate before a slave, you know, and acknowledge the God of Daniel, you know. Acknowledge the God of Daniel. When Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, he knew 
God will preserve him. And we know the story. You know. right. Daniel's three friends were thrown into the fiery furnace you know, because they refused to bow down to the, to the idol of Nebuchadnezzar. You know. The fire was seven times hotter. You know, and they were thrown into the fire. You know. And when they were, they were thrown into the fire, right, nothing happens to them. You know. The fourth person appeared. Jesus Christ appeared. You know. So Jesus Christ rescued them in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the fire, no? not outside the fire. No? Right. So we are living in exciting times. You know? right. And that's why the challenge is come back to God. No? Come back to our awesome, our everlasting God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. No? The great I am. You know? The Alpha and the Omega. No? The beginning and the end. No? Right. Come back to Him. In Jesus' name, you know, right? He's about to do something that's going to astonish you and I. He's going to do something supernaturally that is going to astonish us, you know. And we can be partaker of that works of God and the purposes of God in our life, you know. We can be like Elijah, you know, right? Where when he calls down fire, the fire came down from heaven. You know? Today, you, you and I try to call down fire from heaven and see what happened, you know? Chances is nothing happens, you know. But where did he get the confidence that he knew and he knew when he called upon God, the fire will come down? You know? Because God dwells in him. You know? right. We need the presence of God to, to come back to our life. You know? We need the presence of God to rule and reign over our mind, our emotion, our life, and everything about our, ourselves. You know? We need God to come and Presence to dwell in our family, you know. We need God to come back to His own church, you know. One more time, you know. No more trivializing Him, you know. No more being presumptuous, you know. No more choosing the way we want, but to submit 100% to God. You ourselves 100% to God, you know? So I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters. We are living in an exciting time, you know. Right. And we shall remain strong and steadfast as we put our trust in Him. God has a plan for you and I in the midst of this darkness. God has a plan for you and I in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of the lawlessness, in the midst of the great uncertainty that millions of people are going through right now. And we will be that sword and the light to the earth. We will bring in the last harvest and Christ will come back. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your presence here. I pray that you continue to let your word serve your purposes in all of our hearts, including my own heart, Lord. Lord, I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect, Lord. And we can only cry out to you in repentance. Forgive us of all our sins and all our unrighteousness. Forgive us for trivializing you, Lord and bring you to our level where you yourself are such an awesome God that create the whole universe, create all mankind, create the earth. And the earth is your footstool. How awesome you are. So forgive us for bringing you to our level, Lord. And make you accommodate to our own way of life, Lord. Forgive us. We repent of our sin, our unrighteousness. And right now, we come before you and pray that you come, Lord. You come and draw us to you, yourself. Draw us to your will and your purposes. And you promise that even as we surrender our life to you, we yield our life to you, you're going to empower us with your spiritual authority. You're going to empower us with the accuracy of your word. You're going to empower us with such anointing, Lord that our very life, our very being Lord, will flow rivers of living water to refresh others and point others into the kingdom of God, to provide them hope, Lord, so that none have to take the path of depression, the path of suicide, the path of uh, helplessness, Lord, but they can experience the reality of the salvation of Christ upon their life, Lord. So I pray that you bless all my beloved brothers and sisters in Harvest Connection. Prepare this church, Father. 
empower them, use them mightily for your glory, for your purposes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Your son 